Good afternoon. My name is John Hammond. I'm a professor of cardiothoracic surgery emeritus at Wake Forest University School of Medicine in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. My name is Donald Lukoski. I'm a cardiovascular epidemiologist and associate professor in cardiac surgery at the University of Michigan. Richard Engelman. I'm a cardiac surgeon in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, a clinical professor of cardiothoracic surgery at Tufts University, and uh, chief of cardiac surgical research at Bay State Medical Center. Gabriel Aldea, professor of cardiac surgery, chief of the section of adult cardiac surgery, and co-director of the Regional Heart Center, University of Washington, Seattle. I have a group of colleagues here with me this afternoon and we are going to spend a few minutes telling you about a project that we are working on to educate our specialty about guidelines associated with perfusion. And when I say perfusion, I mean the use of cardiopulmonary bypass. We have a multidisciplinary group involving cardiothoracic surgeons, anesthesiologists, usually cardiac anesthesiologists, and perfusionists, a specialty in itself that is associated with running perfusion equipment, cardiopulmonary bypass. So I'd like to get started, and uh, we are going to go around the table here and talk a little bit about the uh, goals of what we're trying to do. And one of the main goals is try to produce something that is believable and supported by evidence in the literature. And so I'm going to turn the camera here over to uh, Dr. Donnie Lakowski from the University of Michigan. Hi, I'm Donnie Lakowski. I'm an associate professor in cardiac surgery uh, at the University of Michigan. Uh, my role in this project has been to help define the methodology that would be reproducible that we could then utilize across uh, the sets of topics related to these uh, guidelines. The American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology has set forth a methodology by which it's used um, to produce guidelines both related to cabinet surgery and outside of cabinet surgery. What we did was to take that methodology and then apply it in the setting of um, cardiopulmonary bypass guidelines. What we also did was to um, leverage resources made available to us through Dr. Robert Baker in Adelaide, Australia. His colleagues took forth uh, a set of um, PubMed searches, so every article that you might read in literature is indexed. Under, underlying that index are a series of keywords by which if you're interested in a topic related to bypass and cardiac surgery, you might type into, into, uh, into um, a web browser to PubMed, cardiac surgery, so on and so forth. We then produced systematic searches and then utilized a web-based tool that was created in Adelaide, Australia, whereby each one of our um, subsections in the guidelines could then look forth uh, at the abstracts and identify to what extent they would wish to um, accept or reject a given article that would then later be read by uh, the group of individuals who are tasked with a particular topic. We've undertaken this uh, task uh, mostly by conference calls moderated by uh, Dr. Hammond um, from cardiac surgery, by um, uh, folks from uh, perfusion, uh, Kenny Shan and Robert Baker, and also from cardiac uh, anesthesia with, uh, uh, with Linda Shore Lesterson. We have met uh, routinely on these conference calls. We've also worked uh, through um, email and uh, subcommittees to ultimately produce a series of articles that we will then be bringing back to our individual societies for review and uh, in comments. These articles that Dr. Lukowski mentioned will be published uh, as a series of uh, six or seven articles over the next year and a half in the uh, Annals of Thoracic Surgery. So in picking up where Dr. Lukowski left off, uh, uh, we think it is important that this software was developed because it not only has helped us, it will help others that are interested in writing guidelines. And so we think this is a little 
a bit more than just a guidelines for us. It's going to be a guidelines for our specialty and ultimately guidelines for writing in all of medicine. It's really a, a platform, if you will, by which a series of guidelines can be done, taking all of the um, esoteric part and letting us as, uh, as you all as clinicians to, to really evaluate the science. Correct. So in terms of selecting the topics uh, for our guidelines, uh, we went through and had a long discussion and one of the most important topics uh, if you are interested uh, as a cardiac surgeon in uh, treating patients involving the use of cardiopulmonary bypass is what temperature to maintain those patients on cardiopulmonary bypass. So I'm going to turn the discussion over to Dr. Richard Engelman from Springfield, Massachusetts and Tufts University to discuss this. Hi, uh, and I'm uh, Richard uh, Engelman. I'm uh, a clinical professor of cardiothoracic surgery at Tufts and uh, chief of our cardiac surgical research arm at Bay State Medical Center in Springfield. And my interests have been uh, through the years in temperature management related to cardiopulmonary bypass, and that's one of the aspects of the conduct of bypass that we are trying to establish guidelines for. And specifics related to temperature management are where the optimal site is for actually uh, measurement of the temperature because ideally you would like to know what the cerebral or brain temperature is and short of putting a device into the jugular bulb uh, it is very difficult to accurately measure cerebral temperature and it's been found that the best site in terms of cardiopulmonary bypass is by monitoring the arterial outflow port of the oxygenator and there are now presently in every available perfusion system an inline temperature measurement ability for the measurement using uh, a device which will give you an online actual measurement of the arterial outlet as well as the uh, venous or the inflow temperature. So the best measurement during cardiopulmonary bypass we've determined from a number of in vitro studies uh, is using our arterial outlet temperature measurement. In terms of uh, the accurately and most expeditiously determining what temperature to use as a guideline, we have not tried to dictate to individuals practicing bypass. But we have um, the modalities published to indicate that you should not be lowering or rewarming blood temperature from an oxygenator, which you can basically do at will, for more greater than a 10 degree difference between the blood temperature coming into the oxygenator and that going out of the oxygenator. So that a 10 degree difference in either cooling or rewarming is the limit for purposes of avoiding any uh, air or gaseous embolization uh, occurring on either the arterial port or in entering the patient. So basically that is one of our guidelines. Uh, the other is to desperately avoid producing cerebral or brain hyperthermia. That is, uh, it's been accurately and duplicatedly shown that Producing a brain temperature of greater than 37 degrees at any point in time impairs uh, neurocognitive ability and potentially is deleterious to the patient follow following the operation. So that inherently we have determined that the arterial outlet temperature should not be greater than 37 degrees at any point in time to avoid producing inadvertent cerebral hyperthermia, which would be temperature greater than 37 degrees. In terms of where is the optimal site for measuring uh, temperature in the patient during bypass, obviously, as I've mentioned, the arterial outlet, but for the definitive completion of bypass, it's been pretty well determined by a number of studies that the nasopharyngeal site is the optimal site for measuring 
post bypass or a weaning bypass temperature. And subsequent to equilibration of temperature, then uh, obviously the nasopharynx is no longer a, a necessity, and uh, other sites such as uh, bladder or are equally effective once equilibration occurs. But for purposes of weaning from bypass, we feel that nasopharyngeal is better. Uh, as to what optimal temperature to uh, wean or complete bypass, that is an issue that has not uh, been uh, definitively resolved, and there is still conflict as to whether one should rewarm a patient uh, measuring nasopharyngeal temperature to about 35 or 36, or limit it to 34, which would be mild hypothermic levels. There is discussion on both sides of the fence, and we have not taken a recommendation for that. So basically, that's where we now sit in terms of the uh, ideal temperature management during and following bypass. When a patient is on cardiopulmonary bypass, of course, everybody's focused on the heart because that's why they're there, to have heart surgery. Uh, interestingly enough, during a, a large portion of the operation, the heart is really not on cardiopulmonary bypass, but it's being protected by other me methods. However, the rest of the body is, and of course, the most uh, some people, the neurosurgeons, would argue that the brain is more important than the heart. We would respectfully disagree with that, but it certainly is at least as important. And I'm going to ask Dr. Gabriel Aldea from Seattle, Washington, to describe uh, the work that we're doing to de define the optimum protection of the brain during uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. Thank you. So um, the protection of the brain is essential uh, in the conduct of these operations. And again, the patients that present to cardiac surgery, uh, the age and complexity and the acuity, acuity of patients coming to surgery has dramatically changed in the past decade. Even though there have been very significant changes uh, in the way we conduct the operation, not just uh, screening patients, um, but the uh, cannulas and the equipment for cardiopulmonary bypass in the conduct of the operation, uh, neurological dysfunction and stroke and cognitive dis dysfunction remains a major morbidity uh, in the conduct of complex cardiac operations. Um, and uh, although the incidence has decreased, uh, we need to maximize all efforts to, to uh, further minimize this. In the past several deca decades, a, a lot of work has been done in this area. We have an interest, Dr. Hammond's uh, group has a tremendous interest, as m many other groups in the country. And this writing group uh, is trying to uh, bring together all the information that came about in the past decade to further decrease this risk for our patients. The reason for this is that, again, uh, we know that most uh, open surgical uh, cardiac operations uh, that uh, we do are more durable than many other interventions uh, that, for example, can be done with catheter-based interventions, uh, but they do carry a risk of a significant neurological event, albeit uh, quite low. Uh, when we look at other parameters um, of, of non-clinical events, the incidence is substantially higher than what we think it is clinically. So this is a very important area for us to focus to minimize morbidity. And so the protection or the assessments of a patient's um, are really critical and there's been a lot of uh, work done to minimize the risk of this morbidity by recognizing that patients carry different burdens of disease and so the tools for imaging and assessments of patients have changed dramatically um, and so these, these guidelines will, will, will uh, delineate those. Uh, the way uh, aortas could be managed uh, and conducts of the operation done uh, also is being assessed uh, to, again, minimize the risk of uh, patient-related morbidity, but also uh, equipment-related morbidity. And finally, techniques in pharmacology uh, to perhaps attenuate these injuries when, do, when they do occur uh, is also assessed and will be uh, um, described with uh, appropriate levels of uh, um, uh, evidence uh, that came from the assessment by this group. Thank you very much. So uh, we now have an example of three aspects of, of these guidelines. And uh, because we don't have representatives at this particular meeting from perfusion societies and from anesthesia, uh, I will describe in the last few minutes that we have remaining in, in uh, this presentation uh, about the other topics that we will be covering. 
The perfusionists obviously are the ones charged with running the very complicated cardiopulmonary bypass equipment that we have in, in, in our practice. And so we are going to have sections on the issues of uh, uh, the actual equipment that is in use, some of the new technologic uh, advances in that particular equipment, and uh, the way the equipment is put together and where actually some of the measurements that we make, temperature and otherwise, uh, are uh, done on the equipment. We also uh, would like to have uh, a section on perfusion safety uh, since this equipment, like any other kind of equipment, can have malfunctions and ha how we detect any kind of malfunctions and how we deal with that. And we also uh, would like to have a section on a interdisciplinary communication uh, between the operating room team. Uh, that's the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, and the perfusionist. Something that has just been talked about in the last few years about how to optimize the management of a big multidisciplinary operation in an ideal fashion. We also have another uh, section on the protection of another very important organ, the kidney, and uh, that will be part of our assessment. And uh, we also uh, will have a section on anticoagulation. In order to use the heart mach lung machine safely, the blood has to be thinned or anticoagulated so it doesn't clot in this machine and the foreign surfaces, and, et cetera. And also, the, probably the most important thing is how you reverse this anticoagulation safely so the patient doesn't have terrible bleeding problems after the operation. So that is the content of our guidelines, and uh, we appreciate your uh, listening to us, and hopefully you will be able to read about this in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery if you're a surgeon, and also in some other journals uh, where it will be reproduced from the anesthesiologists and for perfusionists. But uh, we I very much appreciate the participation of my colleagues here, and thank you very much.